Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on your situation and your place on this planet today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my friends, Randy and Edith Woodley, who will lead us in today's plenary entitled The Harmony Way. Dr. Randy Woodley is a descendant of Kitawa Cherokee people, is an accomplished author, theologian, and teacher. His writings explore the intersection of indigenous wisdom, ecological sustainability, theology, and spirituality. Dr. Woodley is Distinguished Professor of Faith and Culture Emeritus at George Fox University Portland Seminary and the author of nine books and over 30 chapters. I wanna make sure and say here that three of those books or maybe um, an additional three books are children's books. He's written some beautiful children's books. Edith is a member of the Eastern Band of Shoshone Indians and she is of Choctaw Crow Paiute, Flathead, Blackfoot, and Mohawk descent. She is an accomplished beadworker, seed keeper, and storyteller whose work captures the beauty and resilience of indigenous cultures, highlighting the vibrant stories and traditions that often go unnoticed. Together, Randy and Edith have founded and co-sustain Elohe Indigenous Center for Earth Justice and Elohe Farm and Seed a nonprofit organization that seeks to foster equity and justice between indigenous people and the wider society. At their farm, Randy and Edith welcome visitors who want to learn to decolonize their worldviews through an immersive three-day journey. When I heard that invitation about a year ago, I immediately responded and I was lucky enough this past spring to journey with 12 others to Elohe Farm and immerse myself in that beautiful journey with Randy and Woodley and their friends and their more than human friends as my guides and teachers. And I will share my reflections on that journey um, in the chat. There's a link, there will be a link to a blog that I wrote about the pedagogy, my pedagogical learnings from that journey. But now without any Further ado, or taking up any more of our time, I'll turn it over to Randy and Edith, who I have invited to remember that we are both academic practitioners and uh, practicing academics, that we are right at that intersection. And so we invite them into this time of um, analysis, critique, storytelling as we weave back and forth. Thank you, Dory. It's Thank good to you. be here. Yes. Good morning. Uh, hello to you all. Um, I don't know. I I, I saw an option for three languages. Uh, well, in English would be the fourth, but I didn't see an invitation to translate into academies. <laughs> so um, some of you have to do that on your own, I guess. Uh, I, I try not to speak it as much as I used to. So uh, I uh, retired two years ago from uh, Portland Seminary uh and um uh, uh ever since we've been back to doing what we love and what we started doing which was basically co-learning with others on the ground and so we're going to tell you a little bit about that um give you a little bit of context um who we are where we're from um what we've journeyed uh together and uh, we'll take a little bit of a time to have a few questions at that point and then we're going to get into more of um, like sort of what we see going on in our world and why uh, in terms of uh, the climate uh, crisis that we're experiencing and maybe some uh, good questions will come out of that. So um, you want to start, start kind of telling our story a little bit? Okay. Yeah, that sounds like. This is not rehearsed at all, folks. We're just speaking from our hearts. <laughs> um, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting us come and inviting us to be here and uh, just to tell our story about who we are, what we do uh, here at our farm, at our uh, center here. It's, um, it's a beautiful day and it's hot. It's going to be a very hot day. We're going to get up close to maybe 100 degrees today um, or maybe a little over. It's um, it's been kind of crazy. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of inside work right now <clears throat> in all this heat. So let's see, um, the Elahe journey. Let's see, where do we begin? Um, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, in this story, it's there's um, a lot of things that happen. And um, so it started with a dream. And in this dream, um, Randy had, um, he was, he had this dream. And it was after he had gone to a very big uh, indigenous event and um, I hadn't I couldn't go because I was towards the end of my uh, pregnancy which was kind of a difficult pregnancy so I couldn't go with him and so I had just the end of my eighth month and so anyway so he came home and uh, a couple of weeks later, he had this, he wakes me up in the middle of the night and I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, okay, tell me about your dream. He goes, I had this awesome dream. I want you to tell about it. I said, okay. But he knew better. He knew if he didn't get me up, I would go right back to sleep while he was telling me this dream, right? So he says, okay, hey, let's go to the living room. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, let's go to the living room. Okay. So we go to the living room and he describes this awesome, really wonderful picture of um, just a picture, a beautiful picture. And it was uh, people coming together, learning from all over the world, the U.S. and so forth, everywhere. And coming together to learn, indigenous peoples coming together and learning and um not like a real school school where you you know like a not like an academic school where you have to go in and uh register for classes and stuff like that but just a very down to earth thing where we're doing um where we're getting our hands dirty in the in the dirt and where we're where these um this main center and then there's these bunk houses around and um people working and laughing together and doing ceremony together and all these type of things right can i interrupt real quick sure so i just want to give you context we had been in <clears throat> um service to native people for i don't know at that point uh, years. 15 years um doing everything that you could think of from um working with houseless people to uh, uh, young mothers and uh, teenage pregnancies and um, parenting classes and baby needs and baby needs closets and food pantries and after school tutoring and um, you know cult, uh, native youth culture camps and all we've been doing all this for years but the 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 stigma and really the the wall that we have to bump into every time is the, the the original plan of the United States government and the church, no church is exempt from this, um, was to make Native people dependent upon them, uh, to take away our agency, and uh, as a result, to take away our dignity. And we had been trying to figure out, like, what what can we do? What's a model or whatever that um, that we can give agency back to our people? and uh, and restore dignity and uh, and and so that we understand the solutions are in our hands and not a church or not a government and so that's sort of the context of this and the and in the dream it was really about a place of learning together a place of ceremony um, a, a sustainable regenerative farm um, and a, a community and so yeah that that's sort of the the context of this so yeah good so anyway, um, that was, uh, so with that context, so that was what his dream was about. And by the time he finished, you know, telling me about this beautiful dream that he saw, um, 
it, we were both sitting there in tears and we were like, wow, this is crazy. And so at this point we were still, uh, Randy was still pastoring a church in uh, Carson city, Nevada, uh, where it was, it was a, um, it was sitting on the, the church was sitting on a boarding school and, um, it was the church for the boarding school area. And we had been there going on six years at this time. And so after about a year of us talking with our church people and everything, and at this point, our church was going just beautiful. It was mostly natives and people who were not wanted in the community, you know, like they were ex carnies or ex druggies and, and, you know, all the, um, the Gentiles really the disenfranchised. Yeah. The disenfranchised okay. Gentiles of the community in Carson city and surrounding area. And so they found a home within our church and we, we did church way different and then any other church did in the area. And there was tons of them in that, in that town. And so after um, we were about what, about 60, 70 people. Yeah. Something like that. It was a native American mega church at yeah. about 70 people. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and we had good times. It was a community. You know, we all reached out to each other when someone was in need or, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a beautiful community. And so um, as the church started seeing us kind of moved a different way, they finally, after about a year, they released us and said, you guys can go on, fulfill your dreams and so on and for so forth. And so we did. And so the dream also um, was a location out in um, in South Carolina, in Cherokee country. And so that was our goal, was to start Elahe in South Carolina. So we moved back to, we ended up in Alabama. And as we got there, things, um, you know, it wasn't like, oh, here's our land. You know, we didn't have money to buy land or anything like that. And so it took us four years to finally find a place with all our traveling. And um, we ended up uh, traveling with our children and going uh, homeschool with our kids and um, put about 65,000 miles on our van every year. Um, because we would go from places like uh, Winnipeg, um, Canada, over to um, a different place in Canada, on the western side of Canada, um, then down to Hopi land or different places like this. We were out teaching and um, stuff like that. And so we eventually found a place in Kentucky and it's still partly Cherokee country and uh, it was 50 acres and we were like wow this is going to be great and we had this big plan and uh, we built up so much stuff and uh, then we started our schools and within those schools we uh, you know, started out kind of small. I think we had maybe 25, 30 people the first school. And then um, as time went on, we started doing more schools. We started getting more and more people. We realized we need to build something bigger. And that's when um, we thought, okay, Randy drew up these plans. Okay, we got our center building where we'd go in and meet our learning center and then everything else. But um that didn't work out there um, because of white supremacy. Um, and yes, white supremacy is still alive and going strong. And um, so we were chased out of Kentucky and that's another story <laughs> to be told. 
but we we left Kentucky in 2008 and we found this place out here in Oregon and we moved out here with a handful of our animals our children and a couple of friends that helped us move out here and we uh started Ayla Hay out here and um our first Ayla Hay and or our second Ayla Hay and then um we things were kind of going downhill things weren't going like we were wanting to do our supporters because of uh, what happened in Kentucky our supporters went way down and it seemed like Ayla Hay was just kind of fizzling out and so Randy was like okay Randy and I did some really deep thinking okay let's just sell the property and let's just you know just go on with our own lives Ayla Hay's kind of done. It's kind of fizzling out. Okay, it's we're, we've had a good run, and then um, we had we went to this conference back in uh, early. I think it was February 2019, and in this conference, a lot of crazy stuff happened, and we had some good friends that were at the conference, and uh, one of them, she's now all three of those people are on our board. And uh, one of them, she's uh, Lakota, and she goes, you know, why don't stop? You guys need this. We need Elahe. We hadn't told anybody that we were thinking about ending Elahe at that time. It was just something we just kind of were, you know, playing around with. And as um, so then we went to everybody was like, okay, how do we do this? How do we kind of resurrect this thing again? And so they, they went on and they uh, raised the money. We sold our property there. And uh, then we found this place here in Yamhill. And so it's our third Ayla Hay and it's our final Ayla Hay. And we're here to stay and we are flourishing as Dory sees and uh, she could probably tell you more about our property the beautiful sunsets and all the stuff that we have going on our seed program our um, just the farming area and then our schools that we have um, this year we have uh, six schools going on and uh, Thursday will be our um, next school coming up so we're in the process of trying to get ready for everything right now so um, yeah, that's, and so here's our dream. Yeah. So we're, this, this is a 10 acre property. The small farm that we had, um, about 20 minutes from here was, um, just, uh, the zoning restrictions prevented us from having people sleep over and build places. And, uh, so it was just, it was a three acre property and it, it was really just a farm. We really couldn't, um, manifest what we felt we needed to do and so um yeah this has become you know i think actually uh this will be our fourth school coming up and i think we're going to have six you know all together this year um and uh they're going well you know i mean uh, people leave and and they feel like their worldview has been challenged and perhaps changed and we're hearing a lot of good reports as a result we don't really know what the secret is maybe dory can tell us what the secret is but uh we just welcome people and um, help them walk the land and kind of understand more from an indigenous perspective. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So let's just stop for a minute and, and like questions about our personal story or anything that Edith mentioned um, if, that you have. And we'll, we'll just take like five, 10 minutes and then we'll go on and, and uh, kind of move uh, to a, talk a little bit more about uh, like why we're the Center for Earth Justice. Yeah. So, um, who's handling questions? How's that work? So yeah, we can look for hands to be raised or people can put their questions in the chat. If you put your question in the chat, um, if you're willing to speak it out loud, that would be great. If somebody has a question right now and they're not, and I'm not seeing their hand, they can just unmute and ask their question. 
And while we're waiting for some questions, I'll just um, put this out here. Um, Edith, thank you for kind of charting the territory of how you got to where you are. I remember hearing in person just a little bit more about what happened in Kentucky. If you don't mind revisiting that, I think it is important for us to know um, the experiences, the real lived experiences of white supremacy that have been impeding, that impeded um, or sent you on detours from the dream. Um, if you don't mind sharing that in a, in a little more detail, I would, I would, I would love for our, our, our listeners to hear about that. Sure. Right. Um, she's wanting me to share. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we had a, a 50 acre, uh, uh, piece of land, uh, beautiful. Oh, it's just incredible. Um, a, a giant creek running through it looked more like a river, but it was very shallow. Um, lots of uh, uh, pastures we created. We built barns and um, uh, staff housing and uh, just a whole lot of things. We had a community living there together. We had some el native elders who sort of oversaw everything and um, in our schools, um, cows, sheep, goats, horses, chickens, you know, you name it, all heritage breeds. So we sort of had this like, um revolutionary center going on there and we needed to build more um, room for people to sleep because people were for our schools were sleeping in their cars and uh, in tents and on our couches and we'd already created two uh bunk rooms inside the garage and the dormer over the garage and added bathrooms and did everything we could basically to expand but it wasn't enough and so um when our neighbors found out that we were um, wanting to build some uh, cabins, sleeping cabins. Uh, they came against us. And then uh, we experienced a whole lot of uh, prejudice at uh, the county planning meeting from a lot of our neighbors. About 40 people showed up um, and basically testified against us and, you know, said, uh, you know, uh, Native Americans are drunks. Everybody knows that. These people are going to wander on our property and, you know, get hurt and sue us for everything we got. And another woman said, you know, start crying and who's going to protect our children from these people, you know, off the reservations. And, you know, it's just, I felt a little bit like I'd been uh, transported to like the 1830s or something. But, uh, and then after that, um, uh, one of our adjoining neighbors was a paramilitary group, a white nationalist group. We didn't know that at the time. But they pulled a uh, 50 caliber machine gun and began firing on our property line every day and different times. Um, uh, we couldn't, they had a permit for it, believe it or not. Um, and the uh, county sheriff wouldn't do anything. The state's attorney general wouldn't do anything. Uh, the Justice Department wouldn't do anything. Fair Housing Council wouldn't do anything. In fact, they were, they just sort of looked at us with prejudice and said, you know, it's, uh, I remember the state's attorney general's words were, so you're a bunch of Native Americans living in like a commune out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, so they, you know, obviously didn't get the vision. Um, and um, and so we we really decided after a couple of weeks that uh, it wasn't worth somebody getting killed over, um, even our livestock getting killed over, but especially our children and other people who were there in the community. And um, uh, and so we decided to put a for sale sign on our, our property and sell the dream, basically. Um, so uh, we'd, we'd taken on counties and cities and major employers before in the past with a, uh, doing justice. But at this point, when your children are facing a 50 caliber machine gun, I think you, we just said, well, we're, we're just going to have to fold on this one. It's not worth it, someone getting killed over. So... Um, uh, so we put a for sale sign up and the machine gun fire stopped. Uh, but then the housing market uh, crashed. This was like 2007, 2008. And uh, all of a sudden we had no buyers. We had no ability, property values dropped. Um, and uh, we ended up selling it two years later. We had to, our children were being um, uh, harassed from parents of those people, uh, the children of the parents. Um, and we had to move them to the other side of the county. We had to drive them to school every day um, for those remaining years so that uh, so that they wouldn't be getting in fights and being threatened all the time. And 
and uh and so yeah life was kind of miserable our donor support had basically dried up because of the schools were the big uh sort of big draw and now that we weren't having schools um you know people weren't wanting to support it anymore uh we ended up leaving um selling the property for half of the appraised value and moving to oregon with nothing um and uh and i got a job um, as an adjunct for two years with the uh, Portland Seminary, George Fox University. And uh, uh, and then I was hired three quarter time and then I was finally hired full time. Then I climbed the academic ladder and I became a tenured professor, distinguished professor, and finally retired as an emeritus um, just uh, two years ago. So, um, so we did all that. And now we're back to doing finally what we uh, love doing, which is basically sitting around a fire, um, talking, they're sitting under the oak tree or, you know, those kinds of things and um, having a very dialogical uh, co-learning experience together, which has always been my favorite pedagogy. So that's kind Thanks. of the story of what happened there. Yeah. Thanks, Randy, for giving us a little more detail about that. I appreciate you re revisiting that trauma. I think it's important for us to remember um, that, that the resilience of um, Native people is still called upon in this day. We haven't outlived the need for that and the um, kinds of obstacles that you are up against in trying to live out this alternative vision uh, are, are still real. So I appreciate you revisiting that. The, the subtitle of this conference is innovating religious education through the lens of climate justice. And I haven't experienced many better examples than what I experienced when I was on your farm of innovating, although that might not be a word that you use because I know you're drawing on ancient, ancient wisdom as you innovate, which I think is often what we do when we innovate. Um, but you are certainly um, living a vision of, of, of educating people for spiritual and religious values that centers the earth and climate. So let's move into that part of the conversation. And there's one question in the chat. They, uh, Cheryl, wants, Cheryl, who is from Canada and is thinking about her own place, wants to know um, where in Winnipeg in Western Canada. But let's um, quickly answer that and then move back into um, you know, the, this reflection on climate and how your work is centering the earth. Yeah. So, um, so we were all over Canada and the US for four years. We were basically teaching at uh, universities and uh, seminaries and um, mentoring people on the reservations like Big Grassy Reserve in That's Ontario, um, out to uh, Regina, um, yeah, uh, BC. Um, I see that she was asking, excuse me, that she was asking what were your experiences in exploring sites in Winnipeg and Western Canada? Did you see any difference in terms of the welcome um, of... <laughs> Indigenous. Well, you know, yeah, people were a little more polite, about, but they were still racist. Yeah. <laughs> how, how does that sound? <laughs> we we experienced it firsthand. Um, I don't know, maybe it was just we walked into a restaurant one day with our three kids and um, yeah. And it became a stare it, down. Yeah, everybody just what are you stopped. People doing here? Yeah. Uh, you could hear a, um, you know. And, you know, we had other, we had uh, other that was just that one. negative experiences in Canada, but you know, Hey, we love Canadians. We love all people. So, um, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, I think the two things, one is that the indigenous populations, um, larger there. So there's a little bit more, um, uh, exposure. Uh, but the unfortunate side is that uh, it also, uh, a lot of those old, uh, characteristics that come with, white supremacy are still very present in uh, in a lot of the people. So, yeah. So, um, in, any other questions? I'm, I don't have the chat open right now. But, uh, Go for it. I'm not seeing any other. Um, thank you for. Okay. Answering. Let's move forward. So let's, let's think about um, what's going on here, right? So we know since the uh, industrial age, um, so on, and I, I know there's a lot of arguments about when that is, but let's just say the 1880s. Um, in the United States, uh, we, we know what's going on. We know we're dumping carbon in the air. 
you know, uh, um, at a rate higher than any rate in the past 66 million years. We know our, our you know, um, uh, all the statistics and all the, the graphs are exponentially growing for hurricanes by uh, and uh, earthquakes and um, uh, uh, wildfires and, um, you know, flooding and all of these sort of things we call natural disasters. All that's happening at uh, rates that are increasing in both severity and frequency. And that's been happening for some time. If you look at the, the graphs, they all go up. So I could, you know, if I was doing a PowerPoint presentation, I should, could show you a bunch of graphs. And in every state that I've presented in, you know, that those states also uh, have that in the United States. So, um, and so we, we know there's a problem, right? Um, but I wanted to know why. And my first, my first question was, um, you know, a little bit naive, but, uh, but it's something that, that most people of color ask. It's like, well, why are white people like this, right? Why, why do they basically try to control the earth and its resources and, and, and just take, you know, and have this extractive mentality, right? And so, uh, but that really wasn't seated where the question belonged. Um, I started then asking, well, what is whiteness? And then I got into more of that kind of, you know, I started teaching some white whiteness studies classes and things like that. And, and then I finally began to sort of trace this back to the Western worldview and, um, that it's not a, a epidemic of being white or, and you don't have to, uh, be white to be experiencing whiteness. You certainly don't have to, um, um, uh, to have a, uh, a, a, a certain complexion in order to have a Western worldview. And so it affects us all, right? So, you know, we go back and there are a number of great books that I read that, that influenced me. And because there's some academics here, I'm just going to throw out some of those, those names, like uh, the history of white people by Nell Irvin Painter, sociolog black sociologist at uh, Princeton. Um, uh, uh, the Savage Anxieties by Robert Williams, a native uh, scholar. Um, Utopian Legacies by John Mohawk, one of my favorites. Um, Kelly Brown Douglas' uh, book on uh, Stand Your Ground. So there's just a, you know, a whole lot of uh, research and books that went into me trying to figure out, like, well, what is this Western worldview? Um, and the best I could come up with is that, um, you know, it, it really all traces back to the advent of Platonic dualism. And, um, you know, Plato taught, you know, that you all know Plato's cave and that the, the thing is not really a thing itself. It's what you think of the thing that becomes reality. And, and so in that, you know, that was just a philosophy. But then his student, Aristotle, um, taught that uh, same similar philosophy to Alexander the Great, who then spread it around the known world at that time, creating uh, what would later become Hellenism throughout the whole known world. Um, eventually Rome becomes the inheritor of this, uh, idea and, uh, and then eventually England, which then, um, uh, really, um, uh, majors on the classics. And in fact, in between the 14th and 17th century, they, they have what's called the Renaissance and the Renaissance is this, uh, this movement, um, to bring back kind of Greco Roman ideas philosophies, poetry, art, architecture, etc. And in the middle of that, two formative um, movements were created. One was the um, the Enlightenment, and the other was the Reformation. And those two movements, I would argue, have had more influence around the world than just about anything. And they both doubled down on Platonic dualism. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, you, we have, you know, Francis Bacon in Nature, and we have uh, Rene Descartes, you know, I, um, you know, uh, who said, I, I, I am, uh, I have a body, I am a soul, or I am a mind, right? Um, uh, this whole idea of, you know, and then Adam Smith in economics, and then Thomas Jefferson, and we, we just have, you know, scores of people during that movement who really, you um, uh, reason and thinking, we call it the age of reason, of course, takes over experience in this whole experience, a uh, wholeness of 
uh, our bodies and the earth and everything that's physical uh, becomes sort of a sub uh, set or a uh, the the mind, the spirit in terms of the Reformation becomes a, a privileged sort of a, a way as opposed to a wholeness. So my argument is that's when reality becomes divided. And we don't begin to think in reality anymore. We think in a, a non-reality, which is basically giving more credence to one part of our existence mm -hmm. than another. And um, fortunately, indigenous people around the world haven't been affected as much, although we have been affected. Um, and, uh, and, and are still operating, I think, out of a whole worldview. And uh, how this comes about in the Reformation, of course, is that um, the emphasis on the products of the mind, you know, correct doctrine, correct thinking, correct reason when it comes to those. And they believe them so much that, you know, they killed each other over them. And, um, uh, you know, and you talk about dualism. I mean, that's quite a dualism to the, who the teacher their teacher, uh, the one they're named after, says, you know, like, love your enemies, and they're, like, killing their enemies, right? So that's quite a mm -hmm. jump in dualism. Um, so anyway, um, um, I, we're, I think indigenous people around the world, um, I'm, my context is North America, um, are probably a good resource for looking at, like, how do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? How do we take all these desperate parts and um, cre create a whole reality again. And so um, part of it is just looking at what's happened with, with climate change. I mean, if you um, think about Europe at the time of quote unquote discovery, you know, there was deforestation happening, constant wars, topsoils being depleted. Um, the deforestation, by the way, is, is, you know, mostly hardwoods like oaks that are being, um, they're, they're creating uh, metals and forging and for tools and for weapons, for wars. So they're, they're making iron weapons and things and they're making iron tools so they can build more castles, more um, uh, fortresses, uh, more cathedrals, et cetera. You know, all the things that were important to Europeans at the time. And, um, and, and most people don't know this, the first uh, uh, export from the Americas um, was actually hardwood oaks coming from Virginia. Uh, those uh, passenger ships would bring people over and then they would load the hulls with uh, oak trees and other things. And a lot of those uh, places in Europe were built um, with American oak. Um, anyway, so war, topsoils being depleted, oceans and bays are polluted and, and being fished out. Uh, rivers and streams aren't drinkable anymore. Um, you know, most people are drinking beer, which, you know, is sometimes a good idea. Um, air pollution, uh, diseases rampant, uh, large mammals are going extinct, cities are overcrowded, majority of people are living in poverty, you know, there's a lot of corruption and greed and uh, injustice, uh, except for the, you know, top one percenters. And um, all of these things are happening in Europe at the time of discovery. But I could describe the same things happening here now, because the thing that happened was that um, uh, the uh, Europeans came over and decided that, to bring their worldview with them. And that worldview, unfortunately, is what we are now experiencing. So our topsoil is disappearing, our forests are shrinking, our desertification is occurring, coral reefs are dying, you know, everything, plants, fish, animals, insects, uh, flora are, are all they're going extinct why because the western worldview has you know, devised ways to forget how to live with and care for creation and and i believe indigenous people may be the the very thing that is needed in order to set things straight um so uh you know i could tell you like how bad everything is but i think you all know that so um so let me talk just a minute about energy um, we all know the energy comes from the sun, uh, plants, uh, are the number one, uh, absorbers, but besides that, um, it may be on the tip of your tongues. Um, the, the largest consumers of energy on earth are, you guessed it, phytoplankton, <laughs> phytoplankton, and the largest transfer of energy then is from plankton to phytoplankton. And then after that, it becomes 
you know, the, the, the fish and the whales and, and all that's basically happening without us even really seeing it. Right. I mean, one third of the world's oxygen is, is created by phyto is created by plankton. And so, um, and they're experiencing trouble distress right now too, but, but human beings are really only meant just like other large mammals to be tertiary consumers. We're just like goats. We graze around, right? We take a bite here and we take a bite there. And, but what's happened, I think, since the uh, industrial age is that human beings have become really the, the, um, the primary consumers of the Earth's energy. And the Earth doesn't like that. In fact, the Earth is made to create balance and to um, and basically to uh, restore itself. In fact, the number one rule of nature, I would argue, is adaptation. Adaptation, and that's if I you don't hear anything else today that I said, that's that's what you need to remember. Um, human beings have indigenous human beings have adapted to every climate in the world, right? And they've learned not just to survive but to thrive. But Western peoples basically think they can control nature and make it adapt to them. And that's a huge difference in worldview, huge difference. And, and this, this controlling factor um, really has to do with a lot of this thing that we call the Western worldview in this um, sense that all problems can be solved if you just put your minds to it. And, you know, um, and so, uh, you know, like I, I, I hear people all the time talk about, you know, climbing this and that mountain and conquering the mountain. And I'm like, well, the mountain's still there. I don't think you really conquered it, I, you know. Um, but it, it's just this idea that we can change it to meet us uh, where we are rather than us adapting. And so nature adapts. Right now, the earth is adapting. The earth is creating uh, a problem for human beings um, and and basically, um, we're at the, in threat of being extinct at some point. Some scientists will tell you that we're in the brink of extinction. Um, and it's be, not because of all human beings. It's because of a particular, I would argue, it's because of a particular kind of human being and a particular worldview that really comes from Europe. And, and it's because of a, both a, a Western European male worldview uh, that have been the elites that have made all the decisions and created all the philosophies behind all this. And um, we call this the age of the Anthropocene. But I have a, a word that I like to use, and it's the Europatrocene. Because it was really those particular people who have created the industrial age and the mess that we're in, and this understanding of um, looking at the earth through the eyes of extraction uh, and control. And by the way, um, there's a, a parallel between how the Western worldview looks at both the land and the earth, or I, what I call the whole community of creation, um, and people, especially women. Uh, but I would also add, um, you know, other people of color. Um, and, and that is to control, to objectify, to... Um, seek pleasure from, um, to um, uh, basically extract. Uh, and, and all of those things, you can, you can parallel and even more uh, between um, how the Western worldview and the you know, patriarchal society has looked at women and, and other people of color and how they look at the earth. So it's important. Um, it's, it's important to us as human beings and it's important uh, uh, as to how we treat, uh, treat the earth. Um, but, you know, I look at around me at creation and, and I realize that creator doesn't build the same way that, that we, we want to build. Right. So um, creator builds in a, a way that things adapt and it builds with, with this and nature builds with this unity and diversity principle, you know, everything from the smallest, you know, subatomic particle quarks, for example, um, all the way up to the macroverse is all this blend of unity and diversity, something that indigenous people understand and have understood. It's built into our ceremonies since time immemorial. Um, and 
but the Western worldview looks at things as like homogeneous, right? It's like, you know, let's plant all the same crops, which is dumb, right? Because then there's no microbes that are diverse that will help protect different things. And, and when disease comes, they all die. And we watch that happen in our valley here all time after time. Um, uh, whereas if you look in a, a, a good forest, a healthy forest, you know, it's very diverse and there's all kinds of microbes. And as you say, you probably have some uh, professors of uh, botany and biology and things out there. And, you know, one cup of uh, healthy soil, you know, has billions of microbes in it. It has miles of, of mycelium strands. It's just, and, and so everything is alive, right? But, um, and we need to sort of preserve that uh, as much as possible. Monocropping doesn't do that. So, um, and, and we think homogeneity or homeostasis, that everything stay in the same, we think that's stability. But that's not stability, that's actually chaos. And what we're looking at is nature's chaos right now of, of all of the, the things that are occurring, the things that I mentioned and more. That's actual stability because nature is adapting to spit out the inhabitants of the ones who are creating the problem. Because the whole world is meant to be in harmony. The whole world is meant to be in balance. And that's our primary job as earth keepers. As a, as a Ketua person, and our stories tell us that of our first human beings and first uh, all of our first stories tell us about our role is to be caretakers or what I call co-sustainers of the earth. That's who we're made to be. And if you look at the stories in uh, the um, uh, both the uh, in the book of Genesis, whatever Bible you're using, um, that story is is similar. It's this perfect harmony and balance, and and then humans are created. And what is their role? Tend the garden. Be a co-sustainer. Take care of things. And that word, um, some people have, you know, uh, thought that that word dominion was, you know, has a different meaning. It actually doesn't. King James, who was a king, thought that was a good word, I know. But, uh, you know, but that word, actually a better translation is a co-sustainer. Someone who sustains creation with creator and the rest of creation. And our role as human beings then is to be co-sustainers of the whole community of creation. And whether that means directly with the earth itself, I think that means, you know, bringing water to people who are uh, don't have water. I think that means, you know, stopping people from being trafficked. I think, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can tend creation, the whole community of creation. Um, but certainly we need to pay attention to the earth right now because um, uh, we only have a, a short time to do this. And so um, that's kind of um, my little spiel about uh, um, adaptation, being stability, you know, um, creator builds in these open systems um, and with, with things like fractals, you know, I don't know, some of you study fractals, they're amazing. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's nature is not a closed system, but we build in closed systems. And so as long as, and, and take this for your teaching, take this for your schools, take this for your organizations. Also, the reason so many uh, academic institutions are having a hard time, one, because of course, ac academia is probably the most um, influenced by uh, Western um, platonic dualism than, than anything, at least in, a, in the United States here. Um but two, we build the same organizations and systems with the same idea. We don't build open systems. We don't build adaptable systems. We build uh, for for either homogeneous or we build homeostatic so that, you know, no one rocks the boat. Once it's established, everybody's secure, everybody's safe. But that's not how life is. And so, you know, maybe we can learn something about this. I don't know. I, I hope that we can. So um, sort of to, to sum up that part, uh, the um, uh, the idea is that you know order is actually the planning of um, of, of systems that will um, preserve and sustain and and um, uh, and and not work against entropy, 
but work with entropy. Chaos is attempting to fight entropy through unsustainable, non-adaptive systems. And climate change, things that we're experiencing like COVID, zoonosis, you know, uh, jumping from animals to people, um, a, a lot of diseases um, are because of the Western world's rejection of these natural laws. Nature adapts to survive. Um, under the present system, you know, we could go extinct if we don't. And so, you know, I'm hoping that this is something that we can learn. Um, and if you think about it, like the earth becoming like our cons consuming us. I mean, this is like a horror movie, right? Like the tomato that ate Chicago or whatever that movie was. You know, <laughs> It's like we're we are like facing this thing where the earth it's like uh, in, a, in a sense, it's like cancer. Right. Our own bodies turn against us. Our cells and our bodies begin to turn against us. Well, right now, the earth is turning against us. And, and we need to quickly learn to adapt, create open systems, um, and, uh, and to um, uh, work with the earth and live with the earth instead of just on the earth or extracting from the earth. And so, um, yeah, and, and you, know, you know, if I wanted to wax biblical here, there's lots of scriptures that sort of talk about this. You know, you can find this this relationship with the earth throughout different, uh, the Psalms and Job and others. But um, I like the one in particular, the, the Job passage where it says, you know, speak to the earth and let her teach you. Talk to the fish of the sea, let them remind you. You know, um, uh, all of this, like we're meant to be in this, this relationship because they are our relatives. We're made up of the same stuff, right? Same kinds of DNA. So it's just a, how their range is different. We are part of everything around us, and everything around us is part of us. And um, and I think if we can begin to look at how we become better relatives, you know, that's where the answer lies. So I'm going to stop right there and um, uh, just... Thanks, Randy. Um, uh, I'm just going to invite everybody to take a deep breath in and a deep exhale and maybe give yourself the deepest breath you've given yourself all day one more time. <laughs> Randy, you've given us a lot to ponder here and I just wanna give us a pause to let it kind of settle and know that it settles. Spirit will move within us and some of us will be called to comment. <laughs> or ask a question. While Edith and Randy were speaking, I found myself planting my feet solidly on the ground and remembering that I usually begin these sessions with an opportunity to do that, to just have a moment to center ourselves in place where we are so if you haven't done that yet, do that now, or I invite you to do that now. And I wanna note two things in the chat while others might be putting their questions there, or I see a hand from Noel, so we'll be there in just a second. Elizabeth Nolan from Australia had to leave the call because it was 2 a.m. in the morning, your time, 125. But she noted that she has been on two separate immersion experiences of 10 days with Australian Aboriginal communities in Northern Queens, Queensland, Mapoon, Ram, <coughs> um, and East Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. And those cultural experiences um, were rich spiritual times for her. And she blesses both of you in your work going forward. So let's see, is this Noel? Yes, please do ask your question or make a comment. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, thanks uh, to the Woodleys for their presentations. They're very interesting. Uh, the thing that, uh, among many things, the thing that caught my ear was the mention of schools. And uh, it's not surprising in the Religious Education Association that uh, a member would be interested in schools. So I would like to hear more about the schools uh, that uh, you're uh, creating and uh, implementing. 
And uh, the, the questions that come to mind are the typical uh, newspaper ones, who, what, how, when, and why. And uh, your uh, uh, recent remarks for the past 20 or 25 minutes give a, a good idea, I think, of the, the what. What is the curriculum <clears throat> in the schools? And uh, that has been largely the ideas and uh, experiences and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but I am curious, uh, the who, who, who are the students, who are the teachers, and how many are we talking about, and uh, how widespread are they, and so on. Um, how, uh, how, how is this education uh, from a background of indigenous experience in history uh, communicated. Uh, and when does this take place? Is this a sc school year or uh, very formal, very informal? And uh, the other question, why? I think uh, that also has entered into the presentation so far. So, but anyway, those, those others are ones that I'm very curious about simply because I've been a teacher for many years and uh, I'm always interested in uh, hearing uh, thoughts on education and how education is accomplished. Thanks. Um, well, our schools um, for right now were uh, people, groups, are coming to us, uh, coming to us, sorry, coming to us and asking for us to do a school for them. And because they um, either have heard about what we're doing or heard about from other schools or um, that have happened here. <clears throat> and so they want to be a part of it also. So, um, a typical school or a, uh, a gathering for us would look like um, people come in on Thursdays. Uh, they, we have, uh, while I'm making dinner, uh, Randy gives a tour of the property and they come in, we all eat together as a community, you know, get to know each other, we talk, all this kind of stuff. And then it's kind of like everybody goes to the bunkhouse, they settle in, um, you know, then they meet back at our house on uh, the next morning, on Friday morning. So it goes from Thursday evening uh, to Sunday after breakfast. And we do, Randy and I, and we get volunteers to come in and help us with prepping and cleaning and all this kind of stuff with school, with the mills. And then this year we do. Yeah, this year we did. Before, the last two years, it was it just was us. Just us. <laughs> and it was crazy. Um, but we, uh, people like, um, is it ECC or UCC? ECC. ECC. ECC um, Covenant, Church. Covenant Church has uh, approached us and uh, said, can you do this for us? Do some schools for us. And so twice a year, they come in. And they they bring anywhere between 12 to 16 people from their denomination. And they come in and we do teachings. This is uh, their second step. And uh, they're one of the denominations who's repudiated the doctrine of discovery. <clears throat> and so they said, well, what's the next step? So let's, so the next step is every fall and spring, we send groups to Ayla Hay um, in the, the Woodleys. And then we also have two other uh, elders who come and teach here, uh, Jim Sakura, who's a Hawaiian uh, guy, and uh, Lenore Three Stars, who's a Lakota woman. And the four of us sh um, share our stories. A lot of this is very, well, it's almost it's all very, very narrative. Cool. Yeah, it's it's narrative-based, um, uh, which would be our pedagogy. Um, we I, I never aspired to be an academic, by the way. That wasn't my goal. I never wanted to be a teacher. I, I sort of had this PhD and was working on our school. Uh, I was, you know, I earned the PhD where I was working on the school. And um, and then uh, when we lost everything, it was like, oh, well, what does a person with a PhD do? I guess I have to teach. And then I began to say, well, we're, we're in Indian country. Can I go teach? And so... Um, 
All right. So those are the four people, uh, four of us who basically um, lead the the uh, learning. Um, and then the students are people of, uh, you know, BIPOC and white and all from all over. Um, we also, um, e uh, Edith uh, does an online thing with Lenore and a couple other indigenous uh, ladies, mm -hmm. you know, elders who it's called uh, decolonizing with uh, badass indigenous grandmas. And so they do that online a couple times a year. Um, and they get, uh, it was all women of color until just this last session, which opened up to, to non, uh, non-native, non-BIPOC folk. Um, I've done some online cohorts as well, but, um, and basically we'll, we'll get native people through those, but we're really, um, and, and we get, and probably right now we're probably 5% native. Um, we're really, um, reaching out to a lot more people, but we're right now developing a, a, a particular, uh, it's a different pedagogy um, for Native people, and we've already got sort of students lined up for that now, to or co-learners lined up for that to um, uh, to come and be a part of that. And it's it has to do with you know all of our things. We try to do some ceremony, uh, and uh, they but get the but everything dirty. They yeah. work on the farm. For it like starts with the land. Everything so starts with the land. Yeah. Um, we start with the tour of the land. Um, we bring the land into everything that we do. We talk about the difference between sort of this um, Western European fixation of of uh, controlling everything and and trying to sort of like do away with the distinction of locality, um, and um, uh, and so it's all very place based, if you will. Um, I don't know if we covered all the W's there. Did, I would. Did you, uh just add that there were a couple of other distinctive uh, characteristics of your pedagogy that I experienced. One was radical hospitality that made us feel as if we were at home. Um, the kind of about uh, expanding the boundaries of your home to um, strangers who become friends. And the other was treating our bodies as if they were of the earth rather than separate from it in the way that you um, took great care to not just tolerate dietary um, restrictions, but to welcome them and to just, you know, that was another form of hospitality. Ann Walker has a question. I'm gonna ask Ann to unmute and be with us. OCO, Edith and Randy, my name is Ann. I live yeah. here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm Cherokee Nation. My family also comes from a Musco um, sorry, uh, Mississippi Choctaw folks. So I'm very grateful for your presence with us here today. Um, just want to give a particular uh, wado. Thank you for, um, for your uh, methodological um, everydayness, for the methodological everydayness of your presentation. I like that. Uh, I think that that everydayness is important for creating uh, cognitive dissonance for those of us who find comfort in spaces of academies. So I'm very grateful for your presence, your work, and the intentionality behind your method. Um, so my question is this. Um, it's not really about your farm or uh, pedagogical practice, but it is about your wisdom. Um, I'm asking um, for those of us who work in, um, work regularly in academic spaces, which is many of us here, um, some of us kind of living on the edges of, uh, you know, our, our um, swimming in the waters of, uh, academic coloniality and also wanting to push the edges of uh, decolonization. What are the things that we can do in these contexts, especially Randy, for you, know, having known these contexts, what can we do to push the edges of um, these dualistic narratives of control in our contexts? How can we push? I think your part part of the answer, I think, is uh, in your when you started your question, 
is we have to create disequilibrium. So um, uh, people are used to a particular pedagogy, right? You go to school, you sit in the classroom, maybe you hear a lecture and then you get some time to respond, you write papers. You... So I just was creating disequilibrium all over the place for my years in academia. Um, <laughs> meeting at different places, um, uh, letting people know, like, you know, like my, my philosophy on grades was if you do the work, and you participate, you'll get an A. You know, because that that's a lot of the um, the the uh, intrepidation from students is like, you know, I've got to pass this class. I've got, you know, it's like, no, no. I want you to be free to be yourself. I want you to be free to um, now. If every professor at my you know in, uh, my institution did that, I probably would do something different. But but they were all doing the other thing, right? So I felt like free to do this, right? So. Um, uh, and, and people would say, I mean, I, I, I got a much higher, you know, uh, faculty evaluations than uh, most of the professors, uh, at my university. Um, and, and, but there would always be one or two haters, you know, in every class, you know, it's like, you know, he's a reverse racist and, you know, all those kinds of things, but, but by, by and large, the, the, the good comments outweighed the, the bad. And, uh, and, and they would just say like, um, he, he has us read really challenging materials and, um, and you have to give a lot of yourself in class. It's really difficult to bring your emotional person to class every day or every time. And, and, um, but so I would tell students at the beginning, um, of our sessions, you know, I had all these different sort of uh, philosophy and pedagogy and everything that I would pass out but um but I would say you know that nothing what whatever we create together here will never be duplicated any other time in the in you know our existence our minds are in a particular place right now our bodies are in a particular place our hearts are in a particular place and we are creating something sacred together in this space and and this sacredness by all of us cooperating will be um much more beneficial to ourselves and, and hopefully the rest of the world um, when we can bring everything to it like that. And, and it can't ever be repeated. So, so what we learn, we're creating together. So, so now, and I never called my people students. I always, we always talked about being collaborative learners or co-learners. And, um, and I think it was just creating that both space and sometimes finding other spaces to, to do that in uh, made it different. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, I never wanted to be in that classroom. I always wanted to be under the oak tree or around the fire or because that's where I know the best learning takes place. And so finally we were, I had to do academia, you know, uh, uh, because I had no choice. I had to make a living. I didn't have a place to do what we wanted. Um, but now we're actually doing what we want and we're seeing much better results, right? Although, you know, I have a lot of students who um, uh, still keep in contact and appreciative and tell us about how they're continuing to learn differently, but you, you do the best with what you can in academic spaces and then, you know, but get them under an oak tree or, you know, out on a, the ocean or, you know, I had one class called uh, Theology and Ethic of the Land. And we visited all these places together and sat around and talked under the trees and listened to the ocean. And, you know, and I had my Hawaiian friend Jim come and talk about, you know, uh, uh, the ocean and, you know, how, what it means to Hawaiian people and, you know, all of these kinds of things. So, that, um, uh, so yeah, just, just in, in that class, I think had more uh, effect on people than anything else I ever taught. Um, so yeah, get them out of that space. Thank you. We can't hear you, Dory. There you go. Uh, others who have questions or comments or gratitudes, please um, just go ahead and unmute and speak. And while, while you're doing that, I'll read one from Orla O'Reilly Hazra from Sarasota. She writes, Edith and Randy, thank you for addressing the dysfunctional cosmology perpetuating our sorrows, perpetuating our sorrows. 
And thank you for linking indigenous cosmology to the basics found in science as being embedded, bound and linked together in a process of emergence of faith in the integrity of creation. And I highlighted your sentence, minds, bodies and hearts create something sacred together in a space that can never be repeated. I just love that description of the co-learning act. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, hi, I've got a question. Um, my name is Nick. I'm with the Regional Gathering in the Northeast. Um, thanks to Wanda for setting this up. Um, I, as a, as a, as a white person, um, like a U.S. citizen who, who cares about this and like your, your genesis, like exegesis, like really fabulous stuff. Um, as someone who cares about this work and wants to incorporate these kinds of ideas and this wisdom into my own classrooms, how as a white person do I engage in this in a way that isn't appropriative, that isn't performative? How can I still do this in a way that honors um, the, the actual people in the actual tradition and doesn't just like take it on as one more thing in my like colonial knapsack? Yeah, so do you know how to be a junior partner? I'm excited to learn. Yeah, well, that, that's the first thing I say is learn how to be a junior partner, right? So that you're not, because uh, Americans tend to be, um, want to be large and in charge, right? That's our, that's, that's sort of the John Wayne uh, mentality, right? Um, so uh, learning to be a junior partner and and uh, be willing to make mistakes. Like I'm just giving you some off the cuff advice. Um, I think a lot of uh, white folks are afraid to make mistakes because they don't want to be embarrassed or whatever, but actually that's the best thing you can do because then all of a sudden, um, you're going to say to a native person, I need your help. And, um, and then that sort of reverses the role. Um, that's the traditional role in America. So, um, yeah. Thanks. It looks like Noel wants to jump back in and <laughs> go for it. Noel. Uh, Let's see now. Oh, I am. All right. <clears throat> uh, yes, thanks. And uh, I think there's uh, more than 15 minutes left in our session, so I don't mind asking another question. And this has to do with, um, I live in Newfoundland uh, and Labrador, the province easternmost in Canada. And uh, in the island of Newfoundland, the indigenous population is very tiny compared with uh, the rest of uh, the, the population. Um, <clears throat> but in, in uh, I've lived here for about 45 years, and even when I moved here originally, there was one indigenous group that was very um, deliberately uh, valuing formal education in the provincial institutions. And um, since that time, in the 45 years, that has expanded among indigenous people here. Uh, for example, within the last uh, three years, I think, believe it, I think it was sometime during the pandemic, uh, the university that I uh, taught at until I retired, uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland, it... Um, uh, developed or created the position of a vice president for indigenous affairs in the university. And now there is an indig indigenous student center, for example, which has its own education program and outreach and so on. I'm just curious, um, in the matter of formal education, either developing within or simply employing the uh, institutions that already exist uh, as part of the political structure, the, the location. I'm just wondering what the attitudes and participation is among indigenous families and students uh, in the United States. In Canada, I, I think it's been on uh, an increase over the years. And I'm just curious 
and interested to hear, not just curious, but uh, very interested to hear what the situation is in uh, America. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think it's changing. So um, even at the time when I started my PhD program, um, there was a, a lot of uh, hesitancy on my part because um, a lot of uh, Native folks, especially in more traditional folks, distrust higher education uh, because basically it turns us all into sort of like uh, what we call apples, right? Brown on the or red on the outside and white on the inside. So, so in other words, uh, this brain drain kind of taking people away from their communities and um, uh, creating basically colonial puppets. Um, I think that's changing now. We're a lot more people are interested in decolonization and reindigenization. Um, in Canada, again, because of I think the population, it, things always move differently. Like you guys have way, way more and better uh, Native American movies than we do. Uh, so we're always trying to get the Canadian movies, right? Um, and um, and and we we've been in Newfoundland and with the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people up there. Um, my book, uh, Indigenous Theology in the Western Worldview, is a series of lectures called the Hayward Lectures I did over in Nova Scotia there. Um, and I always remember fondly all the lobsters I ate on that trip. <laughs> but, uh, um, the, uh, uh, but I think, you know, in Canada, there's a, a, a saying going around with Indigenous people, the, the, the education is the, the buffalo of tomorrow or something like that, you know. Um, I don't think I'd go that far. Um, I think <laughs> Buffalo are still the Buffalo if we can get them back. But uh, um, but yeah, I, I think attitudes are changing. Um, I was a co-founder of something called NATE's North American Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies, which is still going on. Um, my friend, one of our other co-founders, uh, Ray Aldred, is at Vancouver School of Theology, their Indigenous Studies program. <clears throat> um, and we're getting, uh, and, and my my involvement, of course, has been in um, more theological study. So that's why those two places. But um, yeah, I think there's lots of places like, uh, you know, uh, Anne was uh, on a while ago. I think um, uh, the university there in Tahlequah has always been a big draw for Native people and people getting educated there. I don't know if you got your education there or not. And, and, but uh, but yeah, so, uh, so it's changing. Uh, I think that's good and bad. I think... Uh, when we succumb to the colonial structures, um, we put ourselves in positions where we have to be extremely strong to resist the coloniality. And um, I think uh, that you can only do that in groups. And so I always advise Native people to do cohorts if they can. Um, that's how I did it. That's how a bunch of us folks got PhDs and uh, doctorates. Um, on our journey, there were there were four or five of us together that journeyed that way and helped each other. And I think I always laugh and say, I think me and another friend of mine, Richard Twist, I think we decided to quit five times that first week, and then we, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's changing. Some good, some bad. Our time is wrapping up. I have one more question that I'm eager to ask, but I'm making sure that I'm not missing any hands out there, um, Randy. Uh, Edith, uh, yesterday, Melanie Harris asked st slash stated um, in the context of a much larger conversation, how do you save Jesus from that terrifying image of the white slave owner? Solving that question, I think, helps the planet. I'm curious if you would share just a little bit about your uh, meanderings with Christianity. You know, you shared a bit about how you were a pastor of a church and pastored many churches along the way, but tell us where you are with that now, kind of internally. We know that you are serving the church, but how do you, how do you um, think that, how might you um, talk to Melody in that statement that she's making? How do you save Jesus from that terrifying image of the white slave owner? Solving that question, I think helps the planet. Um, well, my take on that one is very simple. I, um, I just don't call myself a Christian and, but my faith in creator Jesus is very strong. And 
the way I look at the New Testament and how Jesus is always serving. And he's always uh, gentle and loving and caring. And then he talks about creation. And he's always, and when you think about it, he's always outside, right? And so it's like um, when he's doing his teachings and different things, he's all either on the rivers or lakes or out in the wilderness or somewhere as he's doing his teachings. And he's always um, there with the the poor, the disenfranchised, um, you know, those who are the orphans and the widows and those who are not wanted by your larger society. And so as I look at Jesus in that way, he's the creator of all things. He created this planet. He created me and he creates everything that, um, everything I walk on. And um, so that's my take on how I see Jesus. And he's not this hateful, vengeful person who's there to strike you down. Um, I have a longer version of my story, and that takes place in that way. So um, so we've got a book coming out in October called uh, Journey to Elahe, how um, Indigenous values bring can bring harmony and well-being. Uh, the two of us co-wrote it. And then I'm working on a book right now called How Western Christianity Got It Wrong, Replacing the God of Fear, Violence, and Control with a Deeper Spirituality. Um, so, you know, you can read in those uh, more stuff. Um, in the beginning of Indigenous Theology in the Western Worldview, um, I have this great um, a story about an elder um, who's traditional uh, and, uh, and, and and kind of bring Jesus out of the box with that. Um uh, so I, I don't have much good to say about Western Christianity whatsoever, but I, I do have lots of good things to say about Jesus, um, who is spirit and uh, spirit. We believe very strongly that, you know, spirits guide us and help us. And, and so, um, you know, so we look to Jesus, but we're, we don't call ourselves Christians and haven't for probably 12, 15 years or so, but you know, Hey, we hang around with anybody. So. Um, Cheryl, I see that you've put a, a greeting or a, a salutation in the comments, and I don't want to, I don't want to try to pronounce these words and not do them credit. Would you mind unmuting and speaking your own words into the space? Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I well, I'm in the Tsilkotin territory in BC, and I still haven't mastered the pronunciation of. Thank you. But I have been learning <laughs> my alphabet <laughs> slowly. So kuksdemik, which is thank you to a group of people. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting us. And I just want to go quick. I, I saw uh, Tim Van Meter on here. And, um, and, and there may be other people I didn't get to see on the screen who I might have known in the past. So um Please forgive me if I missed you, but hello to anyone who I've known uh, <laughs> uh, who I missed. So. Thanks. Yes, Tim is lurking about somewhere out there, and Tim will be um, our plenary leader bright and early in the morning with Heber Brown, who is from the Black Church Food Security Network. So the conversation will continue. I just wanted to add that um, I had asked, I had put earlier in the chat, your quote, the Western worldview devises ways to forget how to live with and care for creation. Indigenous people may be the very thing that is needed to set things straight. And this might be in the line of the question that Nick asked. We just have a few minutes left, but I then said, what are some practical ways you have experienced that move people in this direction while centering mutuality, care, reciprocity, and not extraction? And one of the thing, one of the ways you've done that is through your children's books. Another way way you've done that is through uh, becoming rooted, which I'll put these in the um, Google Doc bibliography for the meeting. But becoming rooted is a series of daily meditations that break down this decolonizing worldview into very 
accessible, easy to digest, um, and and you know devotional, meditative ways of uh, of accessing it. Thanks for showing us that. Great, I have it both in hard copy and on my Kindle, so that I can take it with me everywhere I go. Um, but do you have any other examples of um, things you've seen others do that? Can, you know, immersive experiences are probably the best, but they also have a carbon footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other practical ways? Of There's so it? much going on right now. Um, and the, the last, the so it's uh, becoming rooted 100 days of reconnecting with sacred earth. Um, and, and number 100, I think I give a whole bunch of different sort of practical ways, but I also talk about that we, this has to be both personal and structural, you know, that we, we need to be uh, involved in politics and local politics and national politics, wherever we're, our communities, our households, et cetera, uh, and, and have an integrity within ourselves so that we can step up to the next level. Um, and, uh, you know, there's in, in terms of structural level, there are uh, great organizations like um, GARN, uh, Global Alliance for uh, the rights of the earth. Um, there are other earth rights organizations out there that people are, you know, making laws that that give the earth and rivers and mountains, et cetera, aquifers, human rights to be protected. And those laws are occurring. Bolivia did this. Ecuador did this. Santa Monica, California did this. Pittsburgh's doing this. Yeah, there's, there's a number of things that we can do that way. Um, there's a number of initiatives right now that are under... Uh, uh, the platform of uh, climate change, and I, I forget if it's climatechange.gov or whatever it is, but one of those initiatives is called America the Beautiful, uh, and there's now a climate crisis, sort of like AmeriCorps, there's a climate core, um, and, and young people and others, you know, old if you want, can join and get paid, you know, whatever it is, um, to, uh, to be working on this uh, very active way. Uh, planting trees is always another big one, right? Um, you're creating uh, shade and you're creating uh, cooling things down. Um, I always say grow a tomato or grow something in a pot, just even if you don't have a garden, so that you can be involved in that process of life. And then uh, make sure you get open pollinated seeds. We didn't even talk about our seed company, but um, so that they can be planted and replanted and share them with a neighbor. And all of a sudden you got a community of growers. <laughs> um yeah, there's just so many things. Oh, and, and under the America the Beautiful uh, program, um, there, are always a, there are a whole bunch of indigenous um, things that are being done. Last thing I would say is protect the rights of indigenous people. 85% of the world's non-renewable resources are indigenous lands right now. And if you want to protect indigenous, or if you want to protect our uh, the earth and uh, the non-renewables, um, leaving them where they are, keeping them in the ground. You need to also protect the rights of indigenous people. So, um, so get involved in that in what way you can. We have two minutes left. Do tell us more about your seeds. It's oh, a I've been in the room. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, space that you have of collecting seeds. Oh, um, over the years we've collected all sorts of seeds, and I think we've kind of over. Uh, extended ourselves on our seeds. We have so many that we can't keep up with them all. And so, uh, but yeah, we grow everything from vegetables to medicinal plants to um, flowers, wild flowers, growns. wild growns, and all these kind of things. We collect all these seeds and we mm -hmm. sell them on our website. And um, it's just, the way I like to look at seeds, they're life. Seeds are life. Because if you have seeds, you're always going to be able to feed yourself and your family and your friends. And when you get your seeds, all of our seeds are open pollinated, uh, non-GMO, non, um, you know, dumbed down or anything like that. So we have tomato seeds and you plant that and what a and uh, whatever it was is like maybe a yellow cherry, then that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a yellow cherry and um, which are really yummy. And so, yeah, our seeds are like a baby to me. I love them. I talk to them 
and when I'm collecting them, they are so beautiful. If you've never uh, looked at different types of seeds, they are gorgeous. They are, some are really vibrant. Some are really unique in their shapes and their sizes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, I think that is a beautiful benediction. Seeds are life and we must remember that small acts are not insignificant. And we are just really grateful for you inviting us into your space and sharing this time with us. We could not be more appreciative. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. I uh, wish we could meet in person, but hope to see you sometime. Yes. Thank we'll you. see you soon. Take care.